I think everybody's first thought is mediocrity is no longer accepted. I want to be the best. I think anyone who is in this profession, you have to be type A. Yeah, I just like to win. If you're not first, you're last, Ricky Bobby. to do everything right when it counts and be that guy who comes in first on game day. I do hold a high standard and I want to win and I want to be invited back as an instructor. You have some doubts whether you belong, whether that you were prepared adequately for this course. So you just wanna make sure that you uh, <laughs> not mess up, you know? Very nervous coming in here. This is reputation of not an easy place to go through. Oh, It's been said that to become the best, you must be at your best when it matters most. You must prove what you're capable of under the most extreme conditions when everyone's watching. In the world of combat aviation, the elite of the elite are invited to a program known as WTI the Marines Weapons and Tactics Instructor Course. This is their Top Gun school. And when pilots take to the skies here at WTI, it's a grueling test. And by the end, those who rise to the occasion prove they are hands down the top combat pilots anywhere. Here in Yuma, Arizona, these students come for the best training in the world. We're more lethal than we've ever been. You do not want to be on the receiving end of four F-35s uh, flying across the range. Welcome to Yuma. On this airstrip, WTI's intensive seven-week training program is underway. The best of the best pilots from every squadron in the Marine Corps are here to prove they are the elite of the elite. Twice a year, every squadron gets to send one of their pilots from their ready room here to participate in the weapons and tactics instructor course. The whole goal of that is to make them an instructor who can then go back to their squadron, provide those lessons learned, and make sure their unit is ready for combat. The program is an absolute beast, training over 4,500 Marines on the ground and in the air. Their collective goal, to hone an overall fighting machine known as the MAGTAF, the Marine Air Ground Task Force. Individually, though, the combat pilots invited here are out to perfect their specialty, operating an unrivaled fleet that includes F-35 stealth fighters, CH-53 helicopters, MV-22 Ospreys, KC-130 transport planes, F-18 Hornets, as well as Cobra Combat and Huey helicopters. It's about being the best flight leader and instructor of that type model series and understanding how the MAGTAF is going to fight and succeed in combat. The seven-week program is broken up into sections. For three weeks, the students learn tactics in the classroom and perfect them in simulators. The final four-week stretch is flight phase, 
where they'll face large-scale combat exercises known as evolutions. These are actual missions, most using live ammunition, and they are the true test that defines each student's performance. Execute to perfection and prove yourself as the elite of the elite. Slip up, and you might not graduate at all. We hold people to a standard. And if you meet the standard, you graduate and you pass. If you don't meet the standard, then you don't. For those that make it through and graduate, they earn the right to wear the WTI patch, recognition that they have reached the pinnacle of combat aviation. When people see you wearing that patch, they know that you passed a very grueling course. They know that you will hold the standard, so you have to wear the patch well. But there's one thing even more coveted than the patch itself, the holy grail for every pilot here, reserved for only those who truly stand out, an invitation to return as a WTI instructor. The whole time throughout the course, not only are you being evaluated on do you have what it takes just to graduate the course, but we're also in the back of our mind kind of keeping an eye out like, hey, this guy's like thinking pretty well outside the box. He might be a good guy to, to ask back. Pilots are a breed all their own. They're laser focused and determined to perform without excuses. You spend any time around the students of WTI and you realize quickly, most never speak of competition directly. Marines are a unit and they operate as one. And each and every student pilot is gunning to be recognized by their WTI instructors as the very best on the flight line. So if you're not first, you're last, Ricky Bobby. That is the mentality that makes Marine fire pilots so needed by the Marine Corps is the desire to get better and do everything right when it counts and be that guy who comes in first on game day. As WTI's four-week flight phase begins, Pilots immediately take to the air to hone their skills before tactical exercises begin. The F-18 Hornet is the plane made famous in Top Gun. Whether it's dropping bombs or dogfighting, the F-18 is known for its speed and tactical ability. This year, only four elite F-18 students have been invited here. Two pilots and two WIZOs, or weapon systems officers, who ride in the back seat, you know, like Maverick and Goose. The four students have been separated into two teams. Spritz with Niedemeyer, Uncle with Imes. You'll almost never hear their real names because they go by these call signs, each earned in their own unique way. So it's my first unit, and I just look pretty old, evidently. So everyone I checked in, everyone thought I was a colonel. Turned into undercover colonel, just got shortened to uncle. So that's how I ended up with uncle. Uncle is the pilot, Imes is the Wizzo, just similar to myself and Niedermeyer. They're coming from a couple different squadrons, so they're coming together to kind of build some of that nonverbal communication, trying to figure out how do you build that synergy with your crewmate. No. F-18 students Spritz and Niedemeyer had been flying in the same squadron for years, setting them up for success here and giving them a bit of a head start on Uncle and Imes. But out of the pack, Spritz is the clear front runner, entering the course as an already decorated pilot. Spritz is a Top Gun graduate, so he's a pretty good stick and understands how to tactically employ the aircraft, so looking forward to seeing uh, how well they do. My goal coming here is to become a better mission commander. I do hold a high standard and I want to win and I want to be invited back as an instructor if that's where it goes. In only 72 hours, the F-18 students will be thrown into the fire, participating in their first combat exercise. 
and while Spritz is ready, fellow pilot Uncle feels what's at stake. Very nervous coming in here. This is a reputation of not an easy place to go through. I think I'm an average fighter pilot at best. I'm not a great public speaker. I'm not great in front of a room of people and organizing. That's just, that's never been my strong suit. While Uncle and his fellow F-18 pilots focus on the countdown to their first evolution, across the base, the Cobra pilots are gearing up. Cobra attack helicopter is one of the most lethal machines the U.S. military has ever unleashed. And its role in combat is to be a kind of guardian angel for the troops on the ground. A guardian angel armed with high-powered machine guns and missiles. Pilots who operate these helicopters have garnered a reputation of being as tough and aggressive as the Cobras themselves. In this community, there's nothing but competition. You look to the left and the right of you, and you're like, well, if he's still here, she's still here, I'm gonna still be here, right? Whether a pilot flies an F-18 or the Cobra, the gauntlet ahead will test every aspect of their skill. All students compete against the class as a whole and within their specialty. In the Cobra division, there are six elite students. Their call signs, Spaz, Mongoose, Dixie, Sars, Lotion, and Carmex. I had a butt rash. I used all means available, whether it was, you know, gold bond powder, hand lotion, and then lip balm was the one that was actually, uh, took the pain away. <laughs> Carmex's call sign always gets a quick laugh, but don't let that fool you. He knows what's on the line, and he's intent to earn an invite back as an instructor when all is said and done. We check in, I see how well put together the course is. I think everybody's first thoughts is like, mediocrity is no longer accepted. Everybody wants to be the best. Are you ready for this? You're measuring yourself against everybody else that is also in the class. First day I arrived, honestly, it was just a bunch of nerves. Impressions are everything, and first impressions last. This is Captain McKenzie Space. Call sign, Spaz. I take perfectionism to a different level, being a little spastic. That's why my call sign is what it is. It's worth mentioning Spaz is the only female Cobra pilot invited in this class. But don't mention it to her. It's not how Spaz defines herself. No one cares what your gender is. No one cares where your background is. They just care, are you a good pilot? Are you good at your job? And when it comes to it, and if we get called to war, are you ready to do it? I was pretty young when 9-11 happened. Being able to do something and protect other people was something I wanted to be a part of. When I was at school, females still couldn't be in combat. So the closest you could do was being a pilot. And the closest of that was being a Cobra pilot. So I made that decision then, and then I just stuck with it all the way through at that point, because it was the best way I could get there and actually do something for the guys on the ground. While Spaz and the rest of the Cobras prep for their first major evolution in 48 hours, they aren't the only combat helicopter on base. Not far away is arguably the most iconic helicopter in the military, the Huey. If you've ever seen a movie about Vietnam, you've seen a Huey. Daniel O'Connor, call sign Zika is the Huey division head at WTI. He's logged over 2,000 hours in the past nine years as a Huey instructor pilot, and he demands the incoming students meet his high expectations. I think what makes us the best is that we can do everything, and what the Huey gives me is the ability to provide support either offensively or defensively. It becomes a very customer service-based focus. 
The term you're probably going to hear a lot of the times is jack of all trade, master of none. The Huey can't do everything at the highest level of what it's supposed to do, but we are super creative when it comes to solving problems and then doing that on the fly. The four-week flight phase will force the pilots to do just that. In the Huey division, five elite students were invited to show what they've got. Their call signs, Storytime, Coco, Bush Hog, Chopper, and Tinkle. It's a nice day. I was flying and had to go. We have a tube in the aircraft that allows you to do that, but I didn't know how to properly use it. And so when I uh, attempted it, I uh, got just a seat full of uh, <laughs> Tinkle. That's where my call sign came from. It also rhymes with my last name, Shinkle, uh, so it, it works. 4 one will take uh, the last 30 packs. Seven of them will go to Summers. Though he'll never show it to the instructors or fellow Huey students, Tinkle admits he feels the pressure of being here. Not sure what I'm getting myself into. I look at the other guys, start sizing yourself up, immediately feel like, you know, very average or that you don't even really stack up. Their first evolution is also only days away. And as they size each other up and the task ahead, Tinkle's not the only one having some doubts. Fellow Huey student Chopper has the fewest flight hours of the group. You got all the best Huey pilots in the Marine Corps here that are all looking at you, trying to determine if you have what it takes to kind of make it through. Last thing you want to do is let everybody down that put a lot of time, resources, effort into getting you here, and then you kind of mess it up and get sent home. So I would say, yeah, high nerves. While Chopper and the rest of the Huey pilots feel the gravity of the situation, across the base, there's another crew of pilots with a lot less weighing on their minds. Can you put my hair on wing day? <laughs> I don't need hair, I still look good. <laughs> the guys in this room carry themselves a little differently, and for good reason. Here's the star of the show right yeah, here. It's been a while. Most have been through the WTI program as students, and now, they're the ones that will put this year's crop to the test. Don't pay any attention to what he says. That's right, yeah. yeah don't pay attention to anything. Yeah. Okay. Let's try to get these guys rolled up. It's real easy, you know. The students in every aircraft are aiming to prove they're the best. To do it, all of them will have to face off against the guys in this room. They are the Marine Adversary Squadron. Three, two, one. Pack total one, gentlemen, welcome. Uh, we're event three, TNR 3103 today. Uh, TMR is gonna be two kilos. As an adversary squadron, we have one responsibility. Train the fleet to where when we fly with them, they see the kind of tactics that they will be going up against if they were to fight against a peer or a near peer adversary. We study the enemy, we study their doctrine, we study their formations, we study their tactics, we study their weapon systems, their radars, their communications, we study everything about them. Awesome, thank you for your time, gents. The adversary pilots become the enemy to test the students in real world scenarios, and they really get into their role. They are known as Red Air, and their squadron looks like the Soviet Union during the Cold War. If you want to be the bad guy, you have to immerse yourself. When you walk in the ready room, it's gonna be painted a certain color. All your pictures are gonna look like a near peer adversary. This picture is like an old Russian picture, but it's actually a dude that used to fly here. He put his face on that picture. Yeah. It's going to have a certain flavor to it that just allows you to stay in the adversarial mindset. During each evolution, the students have a lot to deal with, but the adversaries are tasked with giving them all they can handle. It's an amazing job. You get to see these guys when they're going through a weapon school, kind of ultra stressed out, working hard, trying to do their best, and you really get to challenge them and see their stress levels peak. The students of the F-18 division will engage in their first evolution against the adversary squadron in only 24 hours. And while the students might be nervous, these veterans are not, not even a little. 
Who's the best dog fighter? Me. Who would Recall say is the best dog fighter? Me. <laughs> no, Recall would say Recall. That's not a fair question because we're all the best in our minds. You put everybody in the world in the F5, would I lose to anybody? And uh, I mean, somebody may be able to beat me, but as of right now, I'm, I've got a pretty good uh, scorecard. I'm sure you're gonna put that on there and it's gonna make me seem like an asshole, but whatever, it's the facts. Just in case, that's what I keep in my pockets. And I keep a pair of spare earplugs, chapstick, and a mustache comb. Shock. We all have type A personalities. All of us want to be the best. And there's no better analogy than a sports team. So I look at my ready room as a football squad. These guys are hard-hitting dudes. All of these hard-hitting dudes will put their WTI students to the test. But there's one member of Red Air who will design the adversary game plan for each evolution. He goes by the call sign, Slag. It's Slag for spelled like a girl, because his first name is Aaron, E-R-I-N. <laughs> Slag has been serving as my pilot training officer for the past year. He's graduated Top Gun. He's one of my top dudes. Prior to this WTI, I think I've flown in seven as an adversary in varying levels. It's a lot of the same things I've already done, but I just leave every single event, which is tiring, but it's fun. When you aim to prove you're the elite of the elite, it takes more than a classroom and a simulator. Throughout the four-week flight phase here at WTI, there are a series of combat exercises growing in size and scale known as evolutions. Today is the very first one. Pitting the F-18 students, Spritz and Niedermeyer, Uncle and Imes, head-to-head -head against Slag and the adversaries. The F-18s are the good guys. They're known as Blue Air, and they'll have to contend with the Red Air threat. The first evolution is known as Strike One. It's gonna be some color, but yeah. As you, as you do. So for strike one, they're looking to search a wide swath of ocean, find two specific ships, which they had dubbed King Panda and then the regular Panda, and execute a surface strike on them with any ship cruise missiles. And the whole time, there's gonna be a bunch of red air breathing down their neck that they're gonna have to fight through while they're searching for these ships and then attacking these ships. So kind of a multi-layered problem. How you guys feeling? That bad, huh? <laughs> it's one of the first uh, big evolutions. I'm the deputy mission commander, so you just want to make sure that you uh, do it the right way, <laughs> not mess up, you know? So. <laughs> Niedermeyer is doing his best to shake the nerves and show his instructors he belongs. You don't really sign up for this if you don't want to be the guy, you know? Those opportunities. Yeah, I'm, big, I'm a big uh, opportunist, so. <laughs> During the first evolution, Major John Easy Martinez will be monitoring the students' performance from the base, while Captain Luke Harambe Stephenson flies with them to assess everything up close. It's gonna be a good one. Nice long drive out to the Pacific Ocean, go meet up with some tankers, get down real low over the water, and yeah. hopefully Josh doesn't get me killed. <laughs> yeah, that's part of the other portion of this thing is we're trying to get down below the radar horizon, so we end up ingressing down low. So the goal is to fly under the radar. <laughs> the guy in the back seat, my wizzo, Captain Jernigan, uh, call sign Niedermeyer. Incredible guy, <laughs> from LA originally. Naval Academy graduate, played on the football team. Ended up punting for Bill Belichick one time. Totally shanked it. He's not in the NFL, so obviously didn't go so great. But <laughs> it's awesome, he's great. I'm done. <laughs> We've been flying together in the same squadron for about two years before coming to this course. This call sign became Spritz on his last deployment because he enjoyed a spritz of bourbon every once in a while. All right. 
I'm the monkey up front, just driving around, you know, being the stick pilot, and he's the goose in the back seat that's, you know, fiddling with the radars and actually making the jet do what it needs to do as far as its sensors and its weapon suite goes. In this first evolution, Spritz and Niedermeyer are tasked with leading the charge, an opportunity to distinguish themselves early on. Fellow students Uncle and Imes will be flying right beside them, looking to execute their role with equal precision. The mission incorporates eight F-35 stealth fighters and eight F-18s on the blue side, assisted by Marine Air Intercept controllers on the ground, who will alert them to enemy aircraft. SLAG and the adversaries have 16 red aircraft that will try to prevent the blue side from achieving mission success. We've been doing practices in the simulators, but now it's kind of time to apply that to the jet. We loaded up a whole bunch of Harpoon and Argum, which are anti-ship cruise missiles and anti-radiation missiles. And they were just like, go out there and don't sink the Carnival Cruise Lines. We're like, okay. Strike one is about to begin. These are the moments that the students prepare for and must seize. There's some natural nerves and some natural hesitations for myself specifically. Being a relatively younger guy, you have some doubts whether you belong, whether that you were prepared adequately for this course because you expect it to be tested. Plan was briefed well, but there are still some big question marks in my mind. We'll see how we do. was to synchronize effects on two separate boats at the same time so that they didn't have any warning that we were coming, all while staying below the radar horizon and against a pretty robust air-to-air -air threat that was defending those ships. Black 6-1, Bolt 9-1, target King Panda. The F-35s go over the top and plow the road for us a little bit, make it so that we don't get shot down on our way to releasing all our weapons. Black is pushing, TOT 35 status Panda. I personally had a little bit more nerves than I normally did in the past in my career with regard to making sure that all aircraft were in the right piece of the sky while simultaneously trying to solve the tactical problem that was at hand. Whenever a pilot climbs into the cockpit, a lot can go wrong. And on this first high-pressure mission, things go a bit sideways for Niedermeyer. Any of these major cities are going to have tons of ships out there. So it's easy to find a ship, it's hard to find the right ship. Once you've found a target, how do we verify that it is indeed the one that you're looking for? And that process took more time than we expected. Full 91, last 61, status Panda. Last 61, full 91, second Panda, Rock 21060, Dale. We did find both ships that we were targeting. One of them was being very cooperative, it was exactly what we expected it to be doing. The other ship, we expected it to be out five to 10 miles away, it was in fact 60 or 80 miles away in a completely different direction and not where we expected it to be. Miser, picture. Black 6 1, Miser, threat group at RAW, targeted by Bolt. Bolt, Bonsai, target, threat group. The clock is ticking. And with enemy fighters closing in, Niedermeyer must decide if they strike both ships or just one. Latch and Salem, target King Panda, 185-25, attack. 
the call was eventually made to just strike King Panda, which was the primary target, but they just sort of forgot that they had found the other ship. In hindsight, we probably could have still hit the other ship, but at the last second, we were like, nope, this guy's too far away. And we made that call real time, and it was not the right call. Last 6-1, Bruiser, King Panda, TFT 3-5, Millerton, Millerton. Not unsurprising that they didn't strike both, uh, just a little disappointing, like thought we could get there. But we dropped it there at the last second. Mission fail uh, on that part. Those Spritz and Niedermeyer, Uncle and Imes, did locate and destroy their primary target. There's no denying that part of the evolution was a failure. Though it's early, Niedermeyer knows any misstep could jeopardize his shot to distinguish himself and even cost him that coveted invitation to return as a WTI instructor responsibility rested on my shoulders to put the rest of the F-18s in a position to attack those boats at the right time, but I did not execute that in the most efficient way. Timing is everything. It's a very short window that you've got to get in and get out. If you blow that, think about all the lives, all the assets that you put on the line. And if you blew it and the whole mission fails, it's a lot to live with. After each evolution, the students must debrief with their instructors to evaluate all that went right and went wrong. In a program that demands perfection, instructors like Harambe don't hold back, assessing everything he witnessed firsthand. I think that the tempo was a little long. Um, I was not thrilled with that. Minutes are huge. Like minutes are potentially an aircraft, two aircraft, five aircraft lost. So that's gonna kind of be the preponderance of the focus of the debrief. I expected execution to go a lot more smoothly. Thank you, sir. Have a good night. You too. Nothing is ever gonna be perfect, but it should be as perfect as it can be. Niedermeyer made decisions that had ramifications on the entire large force package. We didn't accomplish all of phase two. We have panda uh, alive, dead confusion uh, in the target area. Like, which ones have actually been targeted? Which ones are alive? Which ones are dead? And we're just trying to figure out how to strike that till the end. I know Karambe from my first year at the Naval Academy. He was one of the seniors uh, that was instructing me then. And so I think he has a particular interest in my performance. Because of that, he is a little bit more detailed and thorough on my debrief. Yeah, Sweet. nothing else. All right. Harambe told me that I was explicitly not performing to the standard of a future WTI. I feel inadequate and definitely doubt my future as potential graduate during WTI and then whether or not I even belong in this course. The first evolution went about as bad as possible for Nita Meyer. And though the Marines don't keep a real-time scoreboard when it comes to performance, there's no denying he's fallen to the back of the pack for now. When a mission doesn't go well, it can either fortify resolve or break a pilot. For Niedermeyer, it remains to be seen which way things will go. Spaz and the Cobras will have their opportunity, so will Chopper, Tinkle, and the Hueys. The flight phase of WTI is now underway, and it won't slow down. Evolution after evolution, each a chance to lay claim as the best of the best. Thank <laughs> you.